From the headquarters of Talisir English in Quito, Ecuador, this is From the South, and I am Sunny Gray. Mario Abdo Benitez has taken the oath of office to become the new president of Paraguay in a ceremony in Asuncion. Former President Horacio Curtis prepared for the power handover by taking off his presidential sash and handing over his wooden staff. The new president has announced he will name his half-brother and former Central Bank board member Benigno Lopez as finance minister. In his inauguration speech, Abdo Benitez made a call for unity. Today, at the beginning of this new presidential term, we have a chance to start a new stage to decide what kind of country we want, what kind of Paraguay we are going to build together, what history we're going to write from now on, a repeat episode or the beginning of a transformation for our country. Outgoing President Curtis addressed the nation to deliver his farewell message. Curtis is from the right-wing Colorado Party. He highlighted the achievements he said his government made during his five-year term. The outgoing president talked about public works and infrastructure, social housing, and public health as his three main pillars of nation building. However, two million people still live in poverty in Paraguay. I am proud of the work my government has done and everything we have accomplished. We can see it in the whole country. We have built infrastructure. We have modernized the public transportation system, giving housing to more than 37,000 people and increased the public health system budget by 400%. Before the inauguration, the government prohibited any protests. Social organizations called this a crackdown. The arrival of the new president comes at a time where there are protests from social organizations who are calling for better living conditions and more rights. The government responded by suspending the right to protest in Asuncion. Is this what they call peace? When we want to march and they keep us here in this place full of policemen, where is the justice? Where is the constitution that guarantees us to transit all Paraguayans through our territory? Or are we not Paraguayans? Mariano Benitez is a Mbaya Guani leader from the department of Itapua. In Paraguay, 8 out of every 10 indigenous people live in extreme poverty, according to official data. The increase in industrial farms and the lack of labor opportunities exacerbates their situation. We do not have sources of employment. Where can we go to work? I'm 50 years old, and before, I remember we had temporary jobs that helped us, but now that's over. Before, we had our great market. What is a great market for indigenous people? A great forest. Social leaders associate the decision to prohibit protests with the beginning of an authoritarian government 30 years after the fall of the military dictatorship of General Alfredo Stroessner. How do I see the repressive acts from the police? Very bad. They act against our interest. We only ask to make a peaceful demonstration so that the whole world can see us. The restrictions imposed by the government against protest has made more social organizations call for demonstrations. So someone hears their cries for better health, employment, social security, education, and agrarian reform. And our correspondent in Asuncion has more. This morning during the presidential inauguration, many social organizations demonstrated in Plaza Uruguay. Police security forces tried to suppress the demonstration. However, they were able to march throughout the streets of Asunción. People demanded respect for their integrity and sovereignty. They said that during the administration of Horacio Cartes, sovereignty was not respected. And with the new elected president, Mario Abdo Benitez, things will not change, and there will be more economic policies which will not represent the people's interests. The former Brazilian president, Luiz Ignacio Lula da Silva, is due to register his candidacy in a few hours. Lula is currently leading the polls, but doubts remain as to whether he can run. He is serving a 12-year prison sentence for alleged corruption and money laundering. Supporters say his imprisonment is an attempt to prevent him from running for office. The Supreme Electoral Court now has to decide if it will allow him to register as a candidate. Our correspondent in Brasilia, Andre Vieira, has more. 
Today, August 15th, will be a crucial day for the Brazilian left-wing movement. Here in Brasilia, Lula da Silva will be registered as a presidential candidate. While Lula has been detained since April 7th, the people will register the former president in a massive demonstration. Thousands from all over the country are expected to participate in this historic event. The march will go through different areas of the city and will arrive to the Supreme Electoral Court to start the registration process. The march began several days ago with the mobilization of 5,000 MST campesinos arriving in Brasilia. There are also seven social activists who continue a hunger strike now in its 16th day, pressuring the justice system and demanding freedom for Lula. More news in a minute, but first here's a video from our team in multimedia. Welcome back. We begin in Venezuela where President Nicolas Maduro has asked for those suspected of trying to assassinate him to have a public trial. Maduro has also asked the Public Prosecutor's Office and the Supreme Court of Justice to make the findings of the investigation public. He added that there had been plans in place for a transitional, transitional government to replace officials targeted in the drone attack. The aim was not only to kill Nicolás Maduro, but to eliminate all high officials in the country. In the middle of all this chaos and panic, they planned to create a new government, a transitional government to replace us after a criminal attack. I have concrete information on this. All of this was planned from Colombia. We know people involved in the attack escaped to Peru, Colombia and the United States. I asked the foreign minister to order their extradition from these countries. They are criminals that plan to attack our republic. Former Ecuadorian President Rafael Correa said on Tuesday that he did not know of the third report of the expert Roberto Mesa for the murder of Jorge Cabela, the former commander of the Air Force. He was speaking during his appearance before the special committee in the National Assembly via video conference. Denise Herrera explains. Former President Rafael Correa has appeared before the Occasional Commission that investigates the murder of the ex-commander of the Ecuadorian Air Force, Jorge Gabela. The commission has requested his version, and one hour and 20 minutes lasted Correa's appearance. Also, the commission questioned him from the handling of the report delivered by the committee that investigates Gabela case at that time. Finally, Correa said that he didn't know about the the report of the expert Roberto Mesa, who also appeared before the Occasional Commission, and he also said that he uh, received 
a final conclusion with a final report uh, by the committee that investigated that, ca that case at that time. And he also said he, ha he has ordered to deliver this report to the authorities and Gabela's family. Now Korea is also facing other charges. The Comptroller Office uh, General said that, he, uh, that they have found irregularities in a report in uh, administrative charges during the year of 2016, also against former president and other high authorities. So that is all we have for now. We will keep you posted with more information as soon as we can. Back to you at the studio. Ecuador has recorded several traffic accidents in the last few days. On Tuesday, at least 24 people were killed and another 19 injured when a bus crashed into another vehicle on the Pifo Papayata Highway, which is en route to the Ecuadorian Amazon. The Integrated Security Service has confirmed two accidents that took place on the Pifo Papayacta Highway in Ecuador. The bus was traveling to Quito when it crashed into a smaller vehicle, causing accidents which led to the deaths of several people and the injuries of several others. 22 injured and 24 people killed are reported. Additionally, it has been reported that this accident did not affect the people living in the houses where the bus crashed. The authorities said they are waiting for the official report to reveal what caused the accident. The Ecuadorian authorities also said that they are coordinating with the embassies of Colombia and Venezuela to help identify those who were killed. Regarding the national citizenship of the 22 injured, six are Ecuadorians, 13 Colombians and three are from Venezuela. It is a total of 13 women and nine men. Between the 22 injured, we have two minors of 5 and 17 years, both in stable conditions. Also this week, there was another fatal bus accident. Twelve people died, most were fans of an Ecuadorian football team. President Lenin Moreno said on Twitter account he will remove the director of traffic police, the director of the Ecuador Transit Authority and others, as he found that proper protocols were not followed, allowing the bus to enter into the country. Denise Herrera, Telesurquito, Ecuador. New evidence will be revealed in the corruption scandal that has rocked Peru's judicial system. Now, even the country's soccer federation has been implicated. Among those linked to Supreme Judge Cesar Hinostroza, who is being investigated for running a corruption network, is Edwin Oveido, the president of the Peruvian Soccer Federation. When will you deliver the tickets? I will find out tomorrow and I will tell you how it goes. It has to be before. Of course, don't worry. Okay, good. <laughs> a conversation that would have otherwise been of little consequence if Oviedo had not recently been granted favorable judicial resolutions in both cases where he is accused of crimes in his sugar company in Tuman, in the north of Peru. This is an organized crime group. Let's remember that Mr. Oviedo, before the audios were discovered, he had a public prosecutor's accusation and he has been prosecuted for being the perpetrator of the homicide. We are before a delicate topic that has consequences and the rights violations of hundreds of workers of the Tuman company. According to analysts, Oviedo had found, by way of the Peruvian soccer team, a platform to access to different political and judicial institutions. The soccer team has become a national heritage, as important as food, as important as Machu Picchu. Today I have heard journalists, I heard Nicolás Lucar, Peruvian journalists, talking about how we are coming back after the World Cup. Because he said it in the World Cup, after this win, we have to go back to a national reality, where they have to judge Oviedo for the assassinations. Meanwhile, an independent journalist platform announced that they are currently investigating another 60,000 wiretapping incidents quote, legally authorized, unquote, for members of the justice system, and more will be revealed on this matter. Colombia is preparing to head to the polls once again on August 26. This time, people will vote on an anti-corruption referendum that could stiffen penalties. More in this report. Member of the NGO Transparencia for Colombia, Marcela Restrepo, says the anti-corruption referendum to be celebrated in the country is a chance for Congress to change its lack of credibility before all Colombians. 
The Congress has joined the fight against corruption, but now it must really show they are committed to a change. Once the referendum passes with the 12 million votes we hope to get. After that, congressmen have to design a new regulation for national institutions. We want to see them working for our country, and until now, they seem to be very excited about this. During the presidential and Congress election campaigns, every party seemed to be in favor of this consultation. But now, the ruling party of President Ivan Duque has stepped aside of this project. We totally understand why the Centro Democratico Party has decided to do this. Several of their members are linked to corruption investigations, and it's clear that they will be affected by the referendum. During his inauguration speech, Duque said he would not support several projects pushed by Congress despite he endorsed the anti-corruption referendum during his campaign. President Duque doesn't have a clear position in this regard, but he must support the referendum because it's good for the country. This will be good for his government. This will benefit every community because it will bring transparency to our institutions. A week after President Duque defines which projects will be eliminated, Interior Minister Nancy Patricia Gutierrez is expected to announce the end of the other projects that could affect the revolutionary alternative forces of the Commons Party or FARC. It's a pass in false because this is a dirty strategy because even though it has to do with taxes and asset declarations, these projects could modify the political participation of FARC former combatants. This means that they will be left without at least 30 percent of the seats in Congress. So we ask the minister to please carefully read the projects she pretends to discard. The referendum promoters have also denounced the smear campaign pushed by the members and supporters of the ruling party, Centro Democrático. After the sixth round of dialogue with the National Liberation Army, or ELN, social organizations have called on the Colombian president, Ivan Duque, to renew the negotiations as soon as possible. The groups want Duque to listen to civil society and insist upon a permanent dialogue with the ELN. On Tuesday, the president named Miguel Ceballos Avelo as the High Commissioner for Peace. So it remains to be seen whether Ceballos will take over responsibility for establishing communication with the group. Listen to civil society. We're asking the president to listen to us, like he listens to the UN and the Catholic Church. He should also listen to us. We have worked hard for peace for many years. In, Ar in Argentina, the judiciary has rejected a legal challenge filed by the former president, Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner, linked to a corruption case. Federal Judge Claudio Bonadio is leading the investigation on a bribery network that allegedly took place during Fernandez de Kirchner's tomb. So far, a dozen officials have been arrested. Some say this is a new case of political persecution against a progressive Latin American leader, as is, as is occurring in Brazil and in Ecuador with their former presidents. In Argentina, a woman has died after having a backstreet abortion less than a week after the Senate rejected an abortion bill. Women gathered in the capital Buenos Aires to pay tribute to 24-year-old Liz, a mother of two, who tried to perform an abortion using parsley. Liz died after suffering from septic shock and a generalized infection. Activists campaigning for legal, safe, and free abortion in the country expressed their deep regret and insisted that these deaths could have been avoided by legalizing abortion. And Argentina has, re has reinstituted tourist visas for Haitian citizens. Ambassador Pedro Cornelo von Ecken confirmed this week that the National Directorate of Migration had taken the decision to reinstate a tourist visa for Haitian citizens. This decision will come into effect at the end of August 2018. Haitians could have entered Argentina for up to 90 days without a visa once they had valid travel documents, a hotel reservation, or a letter of accommodation and enough money for a stay not exceeding 90 days. 
The Chilean government asked the Vatican to hand over documents related to accusations of sex abuse committed by the clergy against minors as local prosecutors stepped up raids of Catholic churches, uh, church officers in Santiago. Police also searched Chile's Episcopal Conference, the offices of the church leadership, an effort prosecutors said was intended to look for evidence of accusations made against members of the Morris Brothers religious community. Judicial authorization was required for the discovery of the facts that we spoke about, and that was made possible without prejudice of any facility to enter into this residence, so as to obtain evidence in an informative manner as part of the discovery process. In Trinidad, angry residents of Beetham Gardens chased away their member of parliament as he came to assess flood damage by kicking water on him. The MP was touring the area to survey the damage after two days of heavy rain caused floods throughout North Trinidad. Over 40 homes in Beetham Estate were affected. The MP, Fitzgerald Hines, was met by residents who accused him of being an absentee representative. Residents then began cursing and kicking floodwaters on the MP sending him scampering from the scene. Okay, so we're going to take a short break now, but join us again after this look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting. Welcome back. At least 39 people, including three children, have been killed in the collapse of the motorway bridge in Genoa, Italy. The bridge gave way on Tuesday during torrential rain. Rescue teams are still searching for people who may be trapped among the sprawling rubble. The bridge operator, Ost Otto Strade, has come under fire from the Italian government, who say the company should be fined and lose its license. Experts have said the bridge was a cause for concern before its collapse due to decay and deficiencies in its engineering. In a modern and civilized country like Italy, we cannot afford to see tragic events like this. It is not acceptable and those who made a mistake will have to pay until the end. The first action we will obviously do is go and check the stipulated convention with Auto Strait and revoke this concession and heavily penalize those who I think have not fulfilled a clear contractual obligation regarding maintenance. It is up to the dealerships to maintain and monitor safety, and if a bridge like this in Genoa has collapsed, that means that it was not done. The man arrested on suspicion of terrorism after driving his car into pedestrians before hitting security 
barricades outside the British Parliament, has been identified as Salad Kater. London's Metropolitan Police confirmed that the 29-year-old, originally from Sudan, has been arrested on suspicion of attempted murder. His brother described him as a normal person with no affiliation to any religious group and that the family is in shock over the incident. <laughs> Teachers have taken part in a strike in New Zealand. More on that and look at some other news. Teachers in New Zealand went on strike for the first time in 20 years to demand higher salaries from the Labour government. Nearly 30,000 primary school teachers walked out of classes. They are disgruntled at the fact that the coalition government has failed to deliver on its promises of increased funding for social services. Migrants on board the rescue ship Aquarius in the Mediterranean Sea have recounted stories of slave trade in Libya, torture, forced labor and sexual violence. Doctors Without Borders said in Berlin, there are 141 people on board and MSF confirmed that almost 70 are minors, some of whom are unaccompanied. We have also seen scars on arms and backs, people report of beatings, especially in Libya. I will talk about individual cases in a moment. There are stories of abuse, torture, forced labor and slavery, sexual violence, including rape and of extortion. Residents in Bahrain took to the streets once again to denounce the monarchical government and called for its downfall. The march took place in Bilad al qadim on Wednesday. Popular uprisings against the government have been ongoing since 2011, and protests have been met with arrests, blockades and brutality. Some high-profile activists such as Hassan Mushaima remain imprisoned. And we've come to the end of this news brief. For these and many other stories, you can find them on our website at talisiotv.net forward slash English. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Tell Us Your English, I'm Suni Gray. Thank you for watching. This Sunday, a special interview with the UN.